ice cream. So bring ice cream. I know I've heard that some people make it homemade. Bring that, but if not, pick up a bucket and bring it in. And uh, Vicky will find some way to keep it from melting all over while we, <laughs> while we eat. So, and bring some toppings and things too. Ice cream is only there to hold the toppings up off the bottom of the bowl. So whatever you like to bring, uh, bring it down. And we're just going to have a good old time and, and we'll watch uh, God's Not Dead too. Okay? Um, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight. And we're going to take a few minutes here to talk about a man who disappeared. Father, tonight we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you for the youth that are meeting in the back tonight. We ask that you will bless CJ and all of his helpers as they're back there tonight and help them to be able to really work well with those kids. And I, um, I thank you for the rain you've given to us this week. We pray for safety in it. And we ask for our folks that have had surgeries, healing from them, that you will just take care of them. Help us tonight as we, as we look into your word here for a little bit that we could take something with us that will help us to be better followers and better disciples of you. Give us wisdom tonight as we Try to understand in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to go all the way to the beginning of the Bible tonight, the book of Genesis and chapter 5. Now, how many of you cheated? You wonder who in the world the man is who disappeared. How many of you, anybody cheat? All right, maybe you figured it out already. Who disappeared? Genesis chapter 5. It's a guy by the name of Enoch, right? You, you've, maybe you've heard of him before. A guy by the name of Enoch. So we're going to talk about this guy tonight, but it's not just, hey, we're going to study this cute little story or account, you know, and see this happen. This guy just kind of disappeared. Uh, but there's something that we can learn from it ourselves. Uh, now, we're probably not going to just disappear and, and was not like Enoch. It's probably not going to happen to us as a one-time deal. But there are things that we can learn. But have you ever wished that you could disappear? sometime wouldn't that just be so I've always wished that I could be invisible just make myself invisible and you can learn a lot of stuff about what people think about you you know sometimes you wonder if you could just be invisible but may it just be able to disappear you're in a situation it's unpleasant if I could just be gone it's like the State Farm commercial right like a good neighbor State Farm is there or and the guy peers or, or whatever you move to another place sometimes we like just to snap your fingers and you're gone man it, it'd be great to have those superpowers sometime wouldn't it it'd be a lot of fun I mean you could really you could just have a ball with people if that if that would happen but we don't have those kind of superpowers so we have to endure things from time to time it might not be easy but we have to endure things uh, that we don't want to but there was a guy and this is a true story it's in the Bible who disappeared. Of course, his name was Enoch. So let's read this. Genesis chapter 5. Uh, what do we have here in Genesis chapter 5 is a genealogy. And genealogy is the list of who begat, who begat, who begat, who, and all the way down the line. And sometimes you kind of skim through them. Oh, okay, you know, everybody had kids. Well, that's cool. We know that. But then all of a sudden, in the middle sometime of a genealogy, something pops out at you. And you say, wait a minute, that's pretty cool. And that's what we have here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 17. Right in the middle of all the genealogy, so-and-so had this son who lived for so long, he died, and that kind of thing. So all the days of Mahalel were 895 years, and he died. Now, how would you like to live 895 years? Gene, you're just a kid. Just a kid. I'm not even a tenth of the way there yet, right? Um, so he lived 895 years, and he died. I always thought, man, what could your 401k look like at the end of 900 years? And when did you retire? Okay, well, he died. And Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. So this guy didn't begat Enoch until he was 162 years old. Most of you say by the time I was 40, 45, 50, I was done having kids. This guy, 162, and he's still having kids. Maybe only his first one, I don't know. But hey, if you live to be 800 or 900, 162, well, that's just a kid, right? And after he begat Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and begat sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. You heard of the name Methuselah, right? He's the guy that lived the longest of anybody recorded. I believe in 969 years, right? Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then it goes on. 
You say, wait a minute, if you've never read this before, if you didn't grow up in Sunday school or something, you say, wait, did I miss something there? Everybody, he lived 900 and something years and he died. He lived 800 years and he died. He lived 700 years and he died. He not lived 365 years and he wasn't. What do you mean he wasn't? Did he die? Did he get lost? It, it just says he was not. He disappeared from the earth. And this is a, such a captivating thing for us to try to understand here. What happened? We don't know because we're not told. All we know is this. Enoch was and then he wasn't. Where'd he go? What happened? Good question. What I find more interesting, though, is how did this take place, and where was he when he was not any longer? Now, well, you know what happened. You know, we read he was not, God took him. God just took him to heaven, took him to the presence of God. But you wonder where he was when this happened. Is it possible that some folks had invited Enoch and Mrs. Enoch and the kids over for dinner, you know, and they're sitting there talking, and all of a sudden they look, and Enoch isn't there anymore. What do you do, fall off his chair? Look, <laughs> He's not there. And they're scratching their heads and, Enoch? Enoch? Getting a little freaked out, right? We're just not told when this happened. Maybe he was walking down the street and just was gone. Maybe he was talking to somebody in the store. You know how you're pulling something off the shelf and you start talking with the person next to you? And they were talking, he turned around and he wasn't there anymore. Is that how embarrassing when you're talking to someone who's not there anymore? Has that ever happened to you? You're talking, you're talking, and, and you look and guess I'm talking to myself. There's nobody here anymore. Now, it's not such a big deal anymore because everybody talks to themselves, or so it looks like. Everyone's got Bluetooth or something, right? When this thing was just coming out, you, know, you walk in, you know, it's, it always happens like in Walmart, you know? Someone walks up to you and, and they say, hi, you say, hi. Oh, he's on the phone because he's got a little thing in his ear. He's not talking to you. Now you feel like a dope, Right? But uh, imagine someone's talking to Enoch, and they're talking, they turn around, and he's not there anymore. He just was gone. So I wonder what people were thinking. I wonder how widespread this information was. Hey, did you hear about Enoch? Yeah, nobody knows where he is. He's just gone. Now, how long was it before this was written down where people say, oh, well, he's gone because God took him? How long did they search for Enoch? Was there a search party that went out for this guy? I mean, I'm sure this caused a little bit of discussion. And I wonder, this was before the flood, okay? And I wonder somewhere buried behind, underneath all of the, the trash of the flood, if there's a stone tablet, on it is listed a cold case file for Enoch. Missing person. Vanished without a trace. Nobody knows. There's no eyewitnesses. There's nothing. Who, where in the world did Enoch go? And they never figured it out. So we don't know how it happened. But our biggest question is, why are we even told about this? I don't think God was just saying, goodness sakes, we need something to fill the Bible. Well, let's write about Enoch here. I think there was probably something there that we need to hear about what would it be. So I came up with two solutions, two possible reasons why God gave us this account of what happened to Enoch. The first one, I think that Enoch, in a way, is a picture of the church at the rapture. Because there was a lot of wickedness in the world at the time, Matter of fact, if 734 years after Enoch disappeared, if you do the genealogy, is when the flood came. Remember I read Enoch's son Methuselah was born? Methuselah died the year of the flood. It's possible that he died in the flood. My guess, with having a dad like Enoch, my guess is that God was holding some mercy when Methuselah died is when he sent the flood on the earth. I can't verify that for sure, but that that's, happens to be my my personal opinion. You can ask Brother Bill about it. He'll tell you what's, what's right and wrong on that. But it's, uh, he, he, I think Enoch is a picture of the raptured church because the world was becoming more and more wicked and God's about to destroy. Oh, you say, I mean, God waited 734 years after Enoch died to destroy? Well, understand, people are living 900 years, just like today, only waiting 60 or 70 years. Not a big deal, okay, for God, for God to wait. So I think he's a picture of the raptured church. But I think most of all, the reason that we are told about Enoch and how God just took him was to teach us something about what God appreciates about people. God took Enoch because he walked with God. And I think maybe there's something in there where God says, look, not, not that if you please me, I'm just going to let you go to heaven and skip all this stuff on the earth. But I think God wanted us to know what is it that he appreciates about people. 
Let me tell you about this guy named Enoch, okay? This guy named Enoch, he walked with me and, and he loved me. He did all this stuff and I took him and I, and I appreciate him. I want to tell you about that because you need to know what I appreciate. So let's look at a few things here tonight about Enoch and help us say maybe we can be a little bit like Enoch, okay? Not that we think if I'm really, really good, God's going to just take me to heaven, but so we could say we want to please God, right? That's the goal is to bring glory to God and to please him. What, how do we do this? How did Enoch go? Well, first thing we're told is that Enoch walked with God. He just walked with God. It says that there in verse 24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. For 365 years. Now, I find that interesting, because how many days are in our calendar that we use now? 365 days. You know, Bible times is kind of a little different. A lot of times they went on like a 360-day year and things like that. But I just find it's interesting. 365 days we have. Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God for 365 years. How many of us can make it 365 days walking with God? You ever make one of those New Year's resolutions? January 1st. This year I'm going to be a better Christian. This year's going to be the year I'm going to do better this year. And by about 3 o'clock, January 1st in the afternoon, forgot all about it, right? But for 365 years, he, he walked with God. 365 years, by the way, very short life. He died in middle age. I mean, if you die at 365 and your son lives to 969, you die just as a kid, right? But God, well, he didn't die. God took him. God just took him. So, say, forget this year. I don't know if I could live for God for a year, but sometime on Sunday you come in and you say, you know, man, I'm going to live better this week. I'm going to do things right this week. I'm going to please God. But then by Monday, forget about that too. Enoch walked with God. For 365 years, Enoch walked with God, and God appreciated that. And there's every indication, that, well, that's really all that we're told about him, but there's every indication that if he would have lived to be 900 years old, he probably would have walked with God all 900 years too. He walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? What it means to walk with God is to do what he wants every day. It's obedience. It's faithfulness. Just doing what he says. So let's write this down. Enoch was faithful in his obedience to God. That's what God wants. He walked with God for 365 years. He was faithful in his obedience. So let's look at the next one here. Not only was Enoch, not only did he walk with God, but th this is really interesting to think about, understanding the, the culture of the world at the time, which is very ungodly because we're coming in on the flood here, right? Enoch stood out from the world. He stood out from the world. He wasn't like all the people around him. Remember, God's getting ready to destroy the earth in the flood. And he says, look, Enoch, he doesn't deserve to be down there in the world the way it is. He just was not for God took him. It's almost kind of like Elijah. Remember Elijah and Elisha were walking out and, and God said, Elijah, I'm just going to take you up. And Elisha watched as Elijah, this, this whirlwind, this chariot of fire came through and it whisked up Elijah and took him up to heaven. And Elisha standing there like, what just happened? Am I dreaming this? He wasn't dreaming it because Elijah's coat fell and Elisha, Elisha went and picked it up and he actually had something tangible to remind him of that day. But those two men, God appreciated so much what they were doing that he just took them. Enoch was not like everybody around him in the world. He stood out differently. How do we know that? Well, if you keep reading in Genesis chapter 5, you know, we stopped in the middle of this genealogy, right? And we, so and so begat so and so who begot so and so all the way down. And oh, by the way, Enoch never died. He began Methuselah all the way down the line. That's chapter 5. Then you get to chapter 6. Immediately after this, 700 and some years, which is not very long in that day, says, okay, now we're done with the genealogy, and I'm going to end this genealogy by talking about a guy named Noah. Because everybody knows Noah, right? Chapter 6, he says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And that's an interesting subject for another day. They took wives for themselves of whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. 
There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. This happens not too long after Enoch was not. So you get an idea of what the world was beginning to be. In a lot of ways, the world before the flood is a picture of the world before Jesus comes back in the rapture and then the tribulation happens. So you get an understanding here that this world is getting to be very difficult, very hard. It's so bad that God says, I am, I, I'm sorry I even made people. Now, nah, we understand. God knew what was going to happen. He was, you know, it's not like he said, man, I blew this one. I didn't know. He knew it already. But, but the, the sorrow in his heart over what people have done. I'm just going to destroy all the people except Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God allowed Noah to live. And hence, we can all be here today. We're all descendants of Noah if we went back far enough. But in all this situation, in this, in this terrible world situation that they had going on here, Enoch walked with God. He was different. He stood out from the world. Now, if you understand that the world in that day was a picture of what the world is going to be like before Jesus comes back, and you start to understand a little bit more about the world in which we're living now, it's very wicked, and people need to stand out from the world. It's so easy just to do what the world does, to, to fit in with culture, even though it's wrong. God wants people to stand out. In fact, he appreciated Enoch so much taking the stand for right that he said, I'm going to pull you out of that mess. And you don't have to go through death. You don't have to go through any more troubles in the earth. I'm just going to pull you out of it. Enoch was a guy who was different than the world. Now, we use that word world kind of generically, and world is always them. But when we say world, what we're talking about is the sin that is rampant around us, the culture that is full of sin. That's what we're talking about when we say world. Matthew 7, I put this on your outline for you. Maybe you even have this memorized. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. The way to God is difficult. It's not the easy way. It's not the way that everybody's taking. It's straight, it's narrow, it's difficult. And wickedness is the popular way. I mean, it's so much easier in the world today just to go out and do what everybody's doing and say what everybody's saying. Taking a stand might be a lot harder, especially because sometimes it's going to cost you something. So I want you to write this down because I want you to think about this for a minute here. We need strength and character to stand out from the world. It is not easy to do. It is not easy to stand out from the world because people will look at you and say, come on, get with the times. Don't you know it's 2017? Don't you know everybody's doing it? Why do you believe that old book anyway? Which goes back to apologetics. Why do we believe what we believe? If we really believe it and we know why we believe it, then we'll have more strength to stand on what's right. We need strength and character. Tell you what, the kind of Christian life that God wants you to live, the kind of life that Enoch lived, is not a life for wimps. It's easy to do what the crowd does. It's hard to stand out and be different. Christian life is not for wimps. It's not for the faint of heart. It's for people who are going to just, who are going to have umption in their gumption so they can function. <laughs> you ever heard that song? We need strength and character to stand out from the world. And God rewarded Enoch for being like that. He wasn't like everybody else. God rewarded him and pulled him out of the, the world. And he was not. He was not. But there's something else we need to understand about Enoch. And then this should be pretty simple. You have this figured out by now. Enoch pleased God. What it says. He pleased God. But for this, for this one, we actually have to go to the book of Hebrews because Enoch doesn't only show up in the Old Testament. Hebrews 11 
is the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Fame for faith people. Hebrews 11, I actually have it there in your outline if you want to look at it, I believe. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5 talks about him. We don't hear much about him there in the Old Testament, but now we have in the New Testament. It says, by faith Enoch was taken away so he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him. That's a quote from the Old Testament. He just, nobody knew where he was. God had taken him. He didn't have to die. Why? For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That was his testimony. And what is your testimony? Do you know what a testimony is? I may have told you this, but one time when I was in college, I worked at a factory in the summer, and I was working with this girl. Uh, this, I didn't usually work with her, but they got, I moved to another spot for a day or two, and I was, we were packaging up some stuff, and we got to talking, and, and, and I found out she was living with her boyfriend, and, or, or with another guy or something, and she said, oh, we're not doing anything, she said. And I said, ah, you know, I don't know that's a great idea. You know, not that I even believe what she was saying there. But she says, you mean you wouldn't live with a girl even if, you know, nothing was going on? I said, no, because it wouldn't be good for my testimony. And she had no idea what I was talking about. She said, well, what else does your testimony say? I thought, well, she didn't even, of course she wasn't a Christian. She thought it was some kind of a written list of rules I had to do. A testimony, in this sense, is what do people think? It's my reputation as an ambassador for God, because what we do as Christians reflects on God. And what do people think when they see you living as a Christian and they see you acting ways you probably shouldn't be acting? It reflects on God. People think, if you live in sin, people look at you and they know that you have a God that you don't care about. They see a God that you have that isn't worth your dedication. That's one of the reasons that we should be obedient. Because we know he is worthy of it, right? So Enoch pleased God. That was his job. But I, I, want, you, I want you to see this. If you're looking there at Hebrews 11, it says, before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Did Enoch know he was going to be taken? As far as we know, he didn't know. One day he's out walking or whatever, and he's gone. God took him. It's not like God came, as far as we know, and said, Enoch, you know what? I got, I'm going to make this deal with you, okay? Here's the deal. You give me 365 good, solid, faithful years, and I'll spare you from having to go through death. I mean, wouldn't that be a great deal? You see all the people dying and people in suffering and going and all this, you know, think, wouldn't it be nice just say, okay, God, I'm good now. Let's go out of here. Just to skip all that death and pain and suffering stuff. Wouldn't that be nice? It's not like God came to Enoch and said that. It's before any of this happened, he was just faithfully walking for God. As far as we know, there was no indication about when this was going to happen or even if it was going to happen. He just walked with God. Sometimes we think, man, if I knew I only had a certain number of days left. You know, you always hear that. If you only had 24 hours to live and you knew it, what would you do? Well, some people say, I'd go witness to somebody or this. Some people say, I'd jump out of an airplane, you know, and, and parachute or whatever. You know, I'd just have all kinds of fun. But Enoch had no idea this was going to happen, as far as we can tell. You know, the thing is, most of us don't know. None of us really know, right, how long we have. How many people do you know have got up in the morning feeling fine? Heart attack in the afternoon and they're gone. Car accident. Some kind of a violent storm. Something unexpected happened. If they just would have known, say, man, if I just knew beforehand, I'd get things fixed in my life. Enoch wasn't like that. He wasn't saying, I, I know I've only got a couple of years left. I'm going to do things right. He's just faithfully walking with God. And God says, I'm going to honor that. And spare this guy from having to go through death, having to go through all the troubles and trials in the world. Sometimes we want to know the benefits. You know, we want to be like Enoch saying, okay, God, you know, I'll be really faithful to you if you do this for me. No, there's no deals with God. If he wants to bless you like Enoch, that's, that's fine. But we don't do things right for the benefit. And that's why, not, why Enoch did it. He's just going to walk with God. He's just going to do the right thing. And God blessed him for it. So I think there's a lesson there for us. Enoch, he walked with God. That's why he went. He stood out from the world. He pleased God, which is our 
overall goal of life, right? To please God, to glorify Him. That's the whole reason anything exists, but you guys have heard that before, right? And that's what Enoch did. For 365 years, he pleased God. And so this brings me to a question. We stop and we think about this. Enoch pleased God so much that God just took him. What was it that made... Enoch, a man that God was so pleased with. Read there in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Enoch was taken away so he did not see death. We can skip through that real easy, but if we read the rest of Hebrews 11, it would, one word in there would show up more than all the others. What is that word? Faith. Because the whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is about faith. By faith, this person did this. By faith, this person did that. By faith, this person did that. And by the way, I'm running out of room. By faith, a lot of other people did a lot of great things too. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about. But he says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Why? Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So this is the thing that we need to understand. Enoch had great faith. That is the thing that God wants. That is the thing that will allow you to live different from the world. It is faith that God wants. It has always been faith that God wants, right? Sometimes we think of faith in the New Testament, in the New Testament arena. You know, you have faith in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. But in the Old Testament, how was Abraham saved? Even though he 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 wasn't a Christian, this was before Christ. How was Abraham saved? Faith. What the Bible tells us, even Abraham was saved by faith. God always wanted people to believe in him, just to trust him for who he is. When you trust someone, you're showing that that person is worthy. If someone doesn't trust you, it makes you feel bad, right? How come you don't trust me? Do you you think I don't have good character or, or what? Trust shows that someone is worthy of it. And that's what God wants from us. It's faith. It's always been faith. It always will be faith. If we have faith and we trust him enough to obey him, it shows that we understand who he is. You remember theology like we talked about this morning? Who is God? If we understand who is God, all of a sudden that affects us because now I understand that God is all these things, that God has all these incredible characters, not just that he's a creator, but that he's kind, that he's loving, that he's just that he's the ultimate judge, that he's the ultimate rewarder, all these things about God. If I understand all these things about God, I understand who he is, now I understand why I should obey. Because he owns the place, right? And he's worthy of obedience. So, it's faith that he wants because we understand who he is. But that, that brings us to another question, and we have to talk about this a lot because Sometimes we misunderstand what the word faith is all about. What is faith? Because we see this used in our society so many times in the wrong way. Because faith in our society has become religion, right? Do you have faith? Yeah, I'm Baptist. Do you have faith? Yeah, my faith is Catholic. Or Assembly of God. Or whatever. My faith is this, that, that. No, you're using it too generically. Faith is trust. use the word trust it makes a little sense because we have just made faith trite trust is i will put i will rest completely in this thing i believe in it you know how many times you heard the illustration about a chair right but it's, it's so trite but it's so true everyone came in and sat down on their seat here tonight i don't think anybody got underneath and looked to see how strongly it was made i don't think anybody looked to see if someone's going to pull this thing out from behind me you ever do that to somebody on purpose? I did it on accident. I felt so bad. This is one. <laughs> Just pull it out. And the poor guy fell to the ground. And I felt so bad. Um, but some of you mean people have done that on purpose to people. But, the, you know, you had faith in it and, it and it let go. Imagine if you came here and sat down in your seat and it just collapsed. Next time you're not going to have as much faith. But you have faith, you have trust because, you know, if I sit on that thing, I have no question it's going to hold me. I'm just going to do it. But did you know you can even have faith in something or someone that you don't really feel it for? 
I've used this illustration before, like as far as salvation. Some people say, I, I don't get everything about Jesus. I, I'm not sure about it all. Well, faith is like getting on an airplane. I have no idea how an airplane can hold me up. I don't even know who the pilot is. I, I, I can't explain all the wind currents. I can't explain, explain everything that keeps the airplane in the air. I don't know that the engine is going to keep running experientially, but I am having faith by stepping on that airplane. I might be sitting there scared to death, but faith is an action. Faith is I get on the airplane. I might be scared to death, but I'm getting on it. And I don't understand everything about it. You can be saved by not understanding everything about Jesus. How could his death suffice for me? How, how, how could all this happen? But you trust there's, he's the only way to God. That's why faith is so important. You're just understanding, okay, God, if God's everything he says he is, then he can hold me up. Enoch was that kind of guy. He had, he had great faith. Before he was taken, he had great faith. The whole chapter of faith. And by faith, Enoch was taken away. So faith is not just religion. Faith is trust. Uh, Enoch was the kind of guy, he wasn't like, well, you know, I'll, I'll kind of live for God sometime and, you know, and sometime I won't. It was faithfulness. It was all the time. Sometimes we, we live with this attitude, especially in our society, I think maybe it's more dangerous than in other societies, but we kind of treat God in church as just you know, something that we do when there's not a whole lot of other stuff going on. Eh, maybe we come, maybe not, maybe we you know, get involved with God, maybe we obey, you know, just whatever, it's just how it is. That's not the kind of guy that Enoch was. For 365 years, he had faith enough to walk with God and his faith made him faithful. That's the kind of people that we should be. Faithful. Enoch had the testimony that he pleased God. Look at verse 6, though, of Hebrews 11. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is rewarder of those who seek him. It's all about faith. That's what he wants. Enoch didn't just bump into God a little on Sunday morning. No, he lived that way for 365 years. Let's move to the next one here. Enoch. Did I give that one? Enoch had great faith. Okay, move that. I want to go to that next one there. Something that doesn't quite work right here for me. Enoch had a good testimony. Like I just said, I kind of run some of them together here as I get going. Enoch had a good testimony. The way he lived, people could see it. And which brings me to a question. You think, as people look at me, as people look at you, what do they think? I mean, the people that you work with every day, what would they think about you? Would people be surprised that you even attend church if they knew you, or if they worked? with you every day and they hear the things you say and they watch the way you act, they watch the way you respond, they watch the way you talk about the superiors at the company or whatever. I wonder if people would say, God, oh, come on, don't give me that. You're a Christian, really? You're one of those church-going people? Could have fooled me. See, Enoch wasn't like that. And God says, I want to tell you about Enoch. I took Enoch and because I, I was pleased with him because he wasn't like that. He had faith in me enough to obey, and faith is what I want, Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You, you want to please God? You have to have faith. You have to trust, not just for salvation, although that is the only way to be saved, but in obedience. If you don't obey God, it means because you don't trust him enough to understand who he really is. You don't trust him enough to say, I don't understand why he tells me what I'm supposed to do, but he knows better. So I'm going to do it his way. Every time that we sin, in a sense, we're telling God, you don't really know what you're talking about. How would you like it if your kids said that about you? And by the way, if they ever said that to you, I could give them some instructions on what to do next. Okay? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Hey, you know, go clean your room. Not a good idea, Dad. I mean, not a good idea. I can't see the other wall. It's stacked up with stuff. What do you mean it's not a good idea? 
well, Dad, you know, I've been thinking it's probably better for me to play video games. And wait a minute here. You don't trust me to know what's best for you? How about, you know, what they eat? Dad, I think I should have cookies instead of uh, salad. You know, no, 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 no. I know what's best for you. Kids need to trust their parents, and that will make them to obey. When your kid doesn't obey you, it means they don't trust you as the wise parent, and you have to teach them to trust you, okay? And there's ways, there's ways to do that. Uh, but, or you have some consequences there. But when, when God tells us something, read in the Bible, and we say, you know what, I have a better way to do it. We're doing the same thing. You know, God, I know you're like the creator of the universe and everything. I know that you're omniscient. It means that you know everything. I know that you're omnipotent, which means that you have all power. I know all these things about you, God, but I happen to know better than you in this situation. I happen to be omnipotenter than God. That's not even a word, but... I have me omnisciener than God. I know more than God. Because he said do it this way, and now, you know, I, he understands my situation is different. He doesn't understand your situation is different. When he says something, you just do it, right? When we don't, it shows that we don't have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe, here's a few things, they must believe that he is. That's the first thing. You've got to believe that God is. If you don't believe he is, you're not going to obey him. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do you please God? You just have faith that he is. That's another whole question in itself, right? Is there a God? I'm tempted to get off on that, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight. Is there a God? Okay, if, I'll just say this. If you say, no, there's not a God then where did everything come from? Everything came from something. Eventually, go back far enough. But you've got to have faith that there's a God. You've got to have faith that there's a God of the Bible. It's faith, it's belief, it's trust. He says you have, to, you have to do that first. You can't please God without believing that he exists, really. And then you also believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's an interesting statement, I think. You want to please God? Believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing things to get rewards from God. Because he keeps talking about it all the time. Hey, do things, get rewards. Do things, get rewards. So that's not a problem. And that's the kind of guy that Enoch was. He lived in faith, and he obeyed God for 365 years. So what we have to ask ourselves tonight is, I don't think God's going to make me was not like Enoch. But am I living the way that Enoch did? Because God was pleased with Enoch. Is God pleased with us? Enoch walked with God on a daily basis. And God was pleased with that. Enoch stood out from the world. And God was pleased with that. Enoch had faith in an increasingly wicked world. And God was pleased with that. Enoch had a good testimony among other people. And that's what God was looking for. And God said, okay, Enoch, you can bypass death. You're not going to have to die. I'm just going to translate you. I'm just going to take you. Here's the point, my final point I want you to get. God is pleased when we continuously walk in faith. He's pleased. I think I gave you a line where it says please. You can figure out I didn't yell away. But God is pleased when we continuously walk in faith. You want to please God? Remember our boxes that were shown in the morning? I, I, what, the whole purpose of life is to glorify God in a way that means to please God. How do you do it? You sum it up with it. We're talking about making disciples and everything, but all of that boils down to believing in Him. He wants us to continuously walk in faith. Walking in faith is not some high-level, weird, spiritual, metaphysical, whatever thing this is, where we just, you know, we feel real good and spiritual. Walking by faith is simply, I believe there's a God, and I'll do what He says what it means to walk in faith. Don't make it more difficult than it is. Enoch, Enoch, we don't know, did he have daily devotions every morning? I don't know. Did he go to church and sing wonderful songs? They didn't go to church in the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, okay. Did, how did he worship? We don't know how he worshiped God. We just know that every day he was, he was obeying God. That's what God wants. That's obedience. So, could God say any of that kind of stuff about us? That's the question. We live in faith. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.
you and God here just for a minute. We're going to end the song in just a minute. Maybe you need to take this time and just compare yourself to Enoch. Am I like that? Do I believe God on a daily basis without any hope for a reward like Enoch had? You stand out from the world. Maybe take a few minutes tonight and ask God that. Father, tonight, thank you for this lesson on Enoch. That's it. We would be people like that that would please you the way we should. In Jesus' name, amen.